Welcome to the Capturing of La Week 5, Part 2. Since I'm recording it, for those that aren't here, that didn't get to hear the important announcement about the test, they'll just get the Blackboard announcement instead. That's why you should come and see me in person. Unless you're puking your guts up. I don't want you here. Um, okay, so this is the last slide we looked at before the fire alarms went off two weeks ago. Um, just going to go over the directories one more time just so that we have a bit of a segue. Um, ETC is where the config files are. So if there's any settings you need to mess with, odds are they're in the ETC directory. Those are global settings that applies to all applications. Um, VAR, that's where administrative files such as log files and um, mail spools and stuff like that reside. Mount is where file systems get mounted. The home directories where normally your user accounts reside, your home directories. This is similar to C colon backslash users on Windows. And I don't know what the hell it is on a Mac. I think it's actually slash users. They actually did something right. Hey, capital U, yay. Well, Windows is capital U also, but it's not case sensitive, so. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Uh, slash lib, it's where libraries reside. It's similar to the system32 directory for Windows. Uh, on the Macs, they've got a bunch of lib folders also. It's the same structure. And proc is the interface between the file system and the various processes running. Uh, it's a magic directory, unless you know what you're doing. Like I said two weeks ago, don't play in there. You could do bad things. Most of the time, not permanently bad things, but you could definitely blue, well, kernel panic your laptop or your OS. Really? File names. Okay, this is the slide where I was about to hit the button when the alarm went off. File names. Now, most file systems nowadays allow you to have 255 characters in the file names. Um, same thing applies to Linux. Uh, a few differences, though. Um, 255 characters total in a file name does not include the path in Linux. On Windows, it includes the path. So the name of the directories plus the file name is 255. On Unix-like file systems, normally the 255 characters does not include the whole path, it includes the file name. So you can have really big file names. You can use any kind of characters you want pretty much in your file names. Um, it's usually not a good idea to use spaces at the minimum because spaces are used as delimiters in commands, right? ls space dash la. That space has meaning. Therefore, if you have spaces in your file names, you end up having to put all your file names in quotes. Which leads me to, which is not listed on here. Um, you can either use quotes or actually backslashes as it says there. Um, you shouldn't use greater than, less than, pipe. Um, any of those magic characters that you've started learning about that have stuff to do with the uh, moving, uh, redirecting input and output, probably don't want to put those in there either. Colons, not a good idea. Those have special meaning in their own world also. Same thing with brackets and curlies. If you're going to create a file name, Make it fairly plain text, letters and numbers, underscores are good, periods are okay, and dashes are okay. When you start getting exotic with your characters, funny things happen. And strangely enough, if you start throwing in moon runes or Cyrillic or pick your other alphabet here, most of the time it doesn't blow up. Because it doesn't care about those because they don't have special meaning outside the specific language you're dealing with. It's the Specific characters that you shouldn't mess with are spaces, greater than, less than, pipe, um, and there's a few others, brackets. A dollar sign's not a good one, just putting it out there. Uh, backslashes, considering it's an escape character, you probably don't want to use a backslash either. A file name extension is the part of a file name that follows the, the first, the last period. You can have multiple periods but it's the part that follows the last period in the file name. It helps describe the content of the file. Unlike Windows, 
and Mac to some extent. Ex file name extensions have absolutely no meaning on Unix file systems, on Linux file systems. You could have a file that ends in .text and it'd be a complete binary blob and the OS does not care. It doesn't care what's in the file. The, the, the extension is just a way to describe the contents of the file. So if it's .txt, maybe it's a text file. Maybe it's a JPEG, who the hell knows? It doesn't care. Um, the software written for Linux will try to determine what kind of file it is. It's kind of clever enough to figure some of that stuff out. Um, if you have a file name and the very first character is a period, that's considered a hidden file. So if you just do a straight up ls, anything that starts with period gets excluded from the standard ls. That's where the dash a comes in. Because dash a means show me all files, including the ones that are prefixed to the period. So when you mess around in your home directory and you do an ls versus an ls dash a, you'll see there's more files in there. That's just, you know, the hide stuff that you don't need to play with using a period. Um, by now you guys know what PWD is. So when you log in, basically wherever you are at, you're working in a directory, it's the current working directory and PWD shows you what the current working directory is. Okay, now, different file types. They're simple and ordinary files. And I'll actually go into a bit more detail. There's directories, symbolic links, uh, a special file, which is usually a device, and then a named pipe, which is a FIFO. Anybody here know what FIFO stands for? Not you. Yes. Those that worked with old business systems don't get to answer that question. <laughs> you know, there's something called also FILO. First in, last out. First in, first out. There's a few different ways of uh, dealing with some of this stuff. Um, ordinary, simple ordinary files. Normally, it stores information and data normally on a disk. It can have pretty much anything. It could be a program, could be source code, could be images, graphics, text, a Word document. Uh, if you're working on Linux, odds are it's not a Word document. Um, an open office document, that kind of stuff. There are no naming conventions on files, as long as it's less than 255 characters long. You can give it any extension, it has absolutely no meaning on Linux. It's just so you know what kind of document it is. Um, and I was gonna make fun of the Macs because Macs were notorious for not having extensions on their files back in the day. Which means you'd save a Photoshop file and the Mac OS would, in its file system would know it's a Photoshop file because its metadata says it was a Photoshop file. But then you have to use a special tool to extract all the files and you have no idea what anything is because it's like, great logo, no extension. It was terrible. Uh, I, I don't know if they're still like that. They're still like that to some extent. Um, if you don't actually force an extension on it, it actually kind of doesn't put one. Um, some applications require extensions, some don't. Uh, the applications that require extensions tend to be cross-platform applications. That way, when it loads up, I don't know, a .java file, maybe it can assume it's a Java file, and that means it'll probably compile on multiple systems because, you know, the IDEs and the Java interpreter wants it to be called .java. Um, that kind of stuff. Uh, directories. Directories are a named file container based somewhere under the root, under the hierarchy of the directory structure. It contains the names of other files. Now, sometimes files that are contained inside a directory are known as non-directory files. And people look at me and they go, well, what exactly does it mean when you say a directory is a file? Because it is. What happens in Linux, unlike Windows, and actually this applies to almost all Unix-like operating systems. Remember when we talked about inodes two weeks ago? The little magic number that identifies where um, a particular file is on the disk? A directory on a Unix-like file system is basically a special file that's identified as a directory, 
And inside that file is a list of inodes that are contained in that directory. It's a magic file that you can't actually open and edit. Well, you can by going into it and moving files around, but you can't directly open it up in a text editor and change the contents of it. But uh, basically a directory is a special file that says, inside this directory, also known as a file, we have the following inodes. And away it goes and does its magic trick. It's somewhat different from Windows where the directory structure is a totally different beast from the files themselves. The old days of the old DOS file systems was actually somewhat Unix-like, as in the path was part of the file. So when you actually moved the file, you know, you were changing how the things were allocated, but it was included in the file name. <coughs> the newer Windows file systems don't actually treat it that way. They still keep that convention, but it doesn't behave the same on the inside. Okay, a link file. Now this is a specialty of Unix and Linux file systems. And a lot of Nix users always make fun of Windows, because say Windows doesn't have this, yeah they do. We just don't use it because it's stupid. But it's not stupid, actually it's really nifty. Essentially, there's two kinds. There's a symbolic link, also known as a soft link. And what it does is it points to an existing file somewhere else on the file system, and it provides you a path or directory to it. And it looks and behaves just like the original file, except it's a pointer to it. So the closest I can explain it to Windows users is, you know how you have a shortcut on your desktop? You double click on a shortcut and it launches a program that's somewhere else in your computer? Kind of that. I'm, I'm super simplifying, because Symbolic links can have permissions applied to them that are different than the source file. The source file's permissions <coughs> excuse me, will override the symbolic links permissions in the end. Like you can't give somebody extra permissions to a file by giving them a better symbolic link, but you can use symbolic link to reduce the, the effective permissions they have going into it. Once they've navigated into it, they're still, you know, good to go. So essentially, um, what I've what we're doing, and I think I left all my markers at, at work. Um, one example of what we're doing right now is in the middle of migrating one of our systems. And what we've done is we created a copy of the source directory for it. It's a web app, but it's going to be pointing to a new database server. But we don't want to hit the switch all in, we don't want to hit the switch piecemeal. So what we did is we created a copy of the source directory. And we're changing all the parameters that need to be changed in all the different web apps. And we, when we're ready, we're just going to change the symbolic link. We're going to break the original link and switch it to the new directory. So that means the new applications kick in instantly. That's one of the uses. Uh, another use for symbolic links that you'll see is um, to link to old versions of libraries. That's a very common use. Um, Windows used to have something called DLL hell. And Windows 8 and Windows 10, to some extent, has mitigated that issue significantly. It would mean that you had applications that needed certain versions of DLLs, which are libraries, and you needed version 1.6, another application needed version 1.8, and 1.8 wasn't compatible with 1.6. That means the old application would break. You have all this weirdness. Macs get away from doing that by basically taking the entirety of what the application needs and shoving it in a directory with it. Thus, their application installs are twice the size of almost every other OS the footprint of an application because it takes all its libraries and actually makes a copy of them with the application it needs. It's a brute force approach to a problem, but it works. But it works. Uh, on Linux and other Unix file systems, what they often do is you'll have version 1.8, 1.6, 1.5, and then you'll have one called, say it's libssl, so for secure sockets, for secured browsing. You'll have something like libssl.so, shared object, or .lib. And it'll be a symlink to the most recent version. So, therefore, it, all the applications look for that version of the symlink instead of the, the numeric version of it. So you can give files a nice short name while they're pointing at more complex file structures. The command is straightforward. It's ln as in link dash s to make a soft link, the old file name, and what the link is supposed to be called. 
Um, now, when you use a soft link, if you do a text editor and you open up a file that's pointed to using a soft link, you're actually going to open the full, the original path. So let's just say he's a file and you're a sim link to the file and I go to open him. I, I try to open you, it actually opens him. It magically just redirects me. This is not the file you want, the one you want is over there. It's a bit of magic. Um, if I delete him, he still exists, but now he's broken. It doesn't keep track of where the, the originating files, what happens to them. Much like a shortcut in Windows. If you have a shortcut on your desktop and you go and you nuke the source of the shortcut, the shortcut on the desktop never changes, right? It still tries to launch whatever was there or it still tries to open whatever folder or whatever bookmark it is. Then you have an, a hard link. You create a file name, but instead of referring to the other's file name, you're actually referring to the spot on the disk where that file resides. Um, you can have multiple hard links pointing to the same file. And when you create a hard link, it actually creates a physical file on the disk that points to another file. So instead of being a, a pseudo file of soft link is a pseudo file, it does, it's a file that exists but it doesn't occupy an inode. If you create a hard link, it actually occupies a new space. So I'm saying, I want to make a, a hard link to him. What it would do is it would literally create somebody new and put him down there. And every time I want to talk to him, I go through that. If I change this file name, it changes his file name. I change his file name, it changes this file name. They affect each other. Whereas with the soft link, it's a reference to it, like a, you know, a, a temporary reference, as in it doesn't actually affect each other. A hard link affects. Um, because when you're making changes, it actually affects the physical file. So in other words, I rename one file, the hard link doesn't need to know that I renamed the file because it's not referring to him by name, it's referring to him by number. So instead of referring by name, it refers to a student number. Therefore, I can just call out his number and he could suddenly call himself Yankee Doodle and it wouldn't make a difference because I know who he is because I got his number. Okay. When you create a hard link, you rename either file. It doesn't affect the other file. Um, if I were to try to delete him, the hard link still works. Until all the hard links are gone, then he can be deleted. Now this should hark back to your database class. It's a great part of being the database teacher teaching this at this point. Do you guys remember trying to delete a record that has child records? What happens? You're not allowed to until you new call the children, then you can kill the parent record. My lectures were fun. <laughs> but essentially, you have to basically wipe out the whole family tree before you can get rid of the parents. And same thing applies to hard links. I could delete all the sources, but the actual source file never goes anywhere until I get rid of all the references to it. So once I've cleaned up shop and get rid of all the different hard links to that file, then the inode gets released and it's now available for space use. That's just how it works. So there's a few parameters. You can copy a soft link by using the dash D argument. You can copy a hard link by adding the dash L argument. CP has a bunch of arguments and that just happens to be two of them. It literally makes a copy of it. So if you're making a copy of a soft link, it creates another soft link pointing to the same place. If you copy a hard link, it copies a hard link making another copy of that hard link, which means that if I want to nuke him, I got to also nuke both of those. Whereas if I had the two soft links, I can nuke him and then the soft links are useless because they have no brain. Much like my children. 
I'm just kidding. They don't watch my videos. <laughs> but they know I'm kidding. Um, OK, the next one is the special file, also known as a device. There actually are a few other special files, but normally when you use the phrase special, it means a device. It's a mean of accessing the hardware in your computer or on the server or whatever. And it also may access processes, depending. Each hardware device is associated with at least one special file. And a command or an application access a special file in order to access the corresponding device. So for example, on your Linux system, you all have slash dev slash CD-ROM. What does that point to? CD-ROM. You'll also have slash dev slash SDA, serial disk A, SDB, serial disk B. You'll have SDA1, which is, if you remember the stuff on the F disk you were playing with, serial device, serial disk A, partition 1, SDB, SDA2 is serial device, serial, serial disk A, partition 2. Uh, there's a bunch of other ones, slash dev slash TTY. For those of us that are really old and have a certain amount of gray hair in our hair, and we've played with computers, that's a dumb terminal. It's the teletype interface, all known as a serial port. Um, there's also LPT, the printer ports, and a bunch of others. Now there's also slash USB 1, slash USB 2, and uh, various and sundry others. Uh, if ever you're curious at what's in there, log into your VMware, go to slash dev, and then do an LS and look at what's in there. It's basically a file that points to almost every piece of accessible hardware in your machine. The closest effect to this would be if you went to a device manager in Windows to get an equivalency of what's inside a machine. The Linux one is significantly more cryptic. Um, there's some special files that are stored in there. CD-ROM is your CD-ROM drive. FDN, <laughs> that's the floppy drives. Yeah, you need a certain amount of gray hair to really appreciate the floppy drives. The original Edler Scrolls, 22 floppy disks. It took an hour and a half to install and it occupied 27 megabytes. It was great. Yeah. Yeah, the really big one. Yeah. <laughs> it was lots of fun. HDXN, for those are for non-SCSI hard drives. If you don't know what SCSI is, it's an interface to connect serial devi devices, and they're chained one behind the other. HD. X, so it'd be HDA1, HDA2. And for those of you that don't know what those are, those are the old uh, ATA drives, the old parallel drives with the big wide connectors. Uh, you don't find those in these laptops. We actually have one computer we keep at work because we still f occasionally have one of those drives that crops up that needs to be wiped before we send it to be destroyed. So we have this old Dell box sitting on a shelf gathering dust, it gets turned on once a year. Yeah, no, we plug it in so we can run a uh, failed uh, band disk on it. And then we nuke the drive, and then we take a hammer, and we take a big, big spike, and we spike the drive, and then we put it out for recycling. We don't need our source code floating out there. Character devices and block devices. Essentially, character devices are such as the TTY, the serial ports. You type in the letter A, it sends the ASCII character A to the computer. It wants to do the letter A, it sends the letter A back. This used to be like the old line printers. <laughs> They'd send them out one character at a time. It was cool and really loud. Uh, block devices. Those are your chunks of memory. Um, you can move entire blocks of information. And you can take, uh, there's a few examples here on this slide. When you download these slides, you can try to type these into your uh, Linux environment. Now, slash dev slash input slash mouse zero. One of these. Dev TTI, TTY one. That's when you connect 
to your um, Linux machine, odds are you're connecting through a TTY interface. That's your character base interface. LP0, that's parallel port 0. FD0, floppy drive 0. It always starts at 0, not at 1. So basically, 0 is the first one you have in your machine. HDA1, SDA1, those are hard drives. OK. Now we're going to start talking about partitions. So those are the, all the files that you can play with. Um, then we got partitions. And I'm assuming you took partitions in Computer Essentials. No. I think I need to roll my sleeves up a little higher. OK. Maybe that's why people are having a hard time with Lab 6. <laughs> lab 5. OK. Partitions. Let's give you the quick and dirty two-second introduction to partitions. A hard drive is a block of space. When you get it at first, maybe it's pre-formatted. Hopefully not, because if it's pre-formatted, that means you've got to use drive. Unless it says in the box, pre-formatted. You get a hard drive. It's an empty block of space. You initialize this drive by creating partitions. Anybody here ever work in an office environment that had partitions? Okay, don't be shy. Some of us actually had to deal with partitions in our lives. Essentially, what do the partitions do in an office? Other than make it look like a, a rat race maze. It divides the space. So on a computer, on a hard drive, you can create divisions and break the drive up into smaller pieces. Even though it's one drive, you can make it appear to be multiple drives by breaking it down into smaller pieces. And some people are saying, well, that's great, but why would you want to do that? Um, a few different reasons. Uh, reason number one, there once was a time where a hard drive past a certain size didn't work. Your computer couldn't understand. And I don't remember exactly what that magic number was, but it wasn't very big. Something like 256 megabytes. Yeah, people, yeah. That's the size of my avatar. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, no, 256 megabytes, not kilobytes. Okay? It's, you know, 10 minutes of streamed high def video. Like 1080p or 4K video? 4K video, that's about a minute and a half of 4K video. So it's not big, but there once was a time where sure. Operating systems see a partition bigger than that. So what you do is you break up your disk, your gigabyte hard drive, into smaller chunks. And then you have a drive C, a drive D, a drive E, and a drive F. That's one of the reasons why partitions exist. Uh, another reason is different partitions can have different jobs. There are some magic partitions, such as swap. The swap partition is used if you run out of RAM in your machine. It starts swapping it out to, to a partition. Windows has something similar called the swap file. Don't nuke your swap file. You'll have a bad day. It'll recover, but it's just not going to be a good time while it's doing it. Now, the way it works on Linux is, and actually this applies to all operating systems. I should be careful here. Um, you can have four primary partitions. And... 50 odd extended partitions. So you can theoretically take a drive and slice it up into basically 64 or 63 chunks. It's excessive. Um, so you will have the primary partition, which is a partition that exists by itself on the drive. And you also have an extended partition. Because at one point somebody realized, holy crap, I got a two gigabyte drive and Windows 3.1 can't read the whole two gigabyte drive. So you'd create extended partitions. And they, oh, I ran out of partitions because I'm still out of room. So somebody came up with the idea of an extended partition. as a special partition type that contains other partitions. And somebody cheated, essentially. And if you need to have logical partitions, which are 
partitions five and up, you need to have at least one extended partition, which occupies one of the first four partitions. So you have, you break your drive into four pieces, one of those pieces can have as, up to another 50 some odd pieces inside of it. It's sort of like you bought a house and you're allowed to have four rooms. But what's magical is you can have one room you can break down another 55 times. Just that one room is allowed to be broken down into more pieces. It's kind of ridiculous to do it that way, but you know, that's how it is. Um, there's the, the diagram for what I was just talking about. <laughs> so I'll skip this at this point because I finished explaining that. Okay. I just explained what a partition is. A partition holds a file system. The master boot sector contains the partition table. Don't mess with your boot sector. Just saying. That's a tiny little bit of space that's reserved at the front of every hard drive. Your operating system knows it's there. It doesn't let you see it. You shouldn't play with it. That would be as if you were able to reach into a house you built and then pluck walls out without actually hiring someone to do it for you. You say, today I don't want this wall, and then the whole house collapses. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wiring, what's that? Paper insulation, oh no. So don't mess with the master boot records. The partition table resides there. It's tiny, um, it holds four entries. All it holds is four entries that says sector one, sector two, begin, end, begin, end, begin, end, begin, end. It basically holds um, four entries, two sets of numbers, and a type. So one more little identifier that identifies what kind of file system it is that's in that spot. So as it describes there, it First cylinder, last cylinder, what kind of file system? Whether or not it's bootable, that's a, a, a Boolean flag, true, false. Can I boot from this partition or not? And do you, hopefully you guys know what booting means. Computer asks, is there somewhere I can boot from? Looks at the first disk, oh, there's a bootable partition. Looks at sector, whatever it is on that partition, goes, ah, oh, I have an operating system. I can, I can turn on now. Anybody here ever have the experience of no operating system found. <laughs> Is it a good time? <laughs> no, not really. Actually, on Windows and Linux machines, that's not a bad time. On Macs, that's a good time. Is that where you get the bong of death? <laughs> Beep. <laughs> if. Uh, it with. Uh, Windows and Linux systems, you just rewrite the master boot sector and it's fixed. It's, it's too, yeah, exactly. Yeah, sometimes your hard drive's dead and you're toast. Okay, so that's the pieces that make up the, the initial partition table. Um, so there's a partition descriptor which identifies that there's a primary partition or an extended partition. Each disk can only ever contain one extended partition. Just how it is. The first partition on the drive is usually called the primary partition. Why? Because it was the first one that was created. I got in first, so I'm primary. Um, any of the four partitions can be designated as an extended partition. It allows you to create logical drives or sub partitions. Basically, but you can keep dividing that chunk as many times as you want. Now, Linux needs two partitions to exist. Partition number one, the root partition, slash. So you know you go CD slash? That's the, bo the bottom edge of a partition of files. It is required to allow Linux to basically boot. There are a few ways to change that behavior, but essentially it is the root file system and that's all there is to it. It could be an ext2, ext3, ext4. Uh, there's a bunch of file systems it can be. Uh, but ext4 is the current op 
file system of choice. So like how on Windows you have NTFS, and on other operating systems, you know, you had the FAT table, FAT32, and FAT for DOS, whatever Mac is. Um, there's different file systems. Um, Linux has several other file systems that aren't listed here <coughs> that are quite popular. Uh, there was one for a while called Riser FS, which was really popular until the author of it murdered his wife. And then everybody just said, done. No, I'm not, I'm, I wish I was kidding. There's a manhunt. It was great. And all the, all the, all the, the neckbeards all started chasing him. It was great. Um, not quite, but that's not far from how it happened. Uh, there's a few out there that are really popular right now. There's one called ZFS, uh, which is very powerful. There's also one called OCFS. Surprisingly, that one's really good, and it's from Oracle. Who knew? The best product they have is the file system. It allows for distributed file system across a network that looks like a single file system. So you could have the primary partition and each of your buddies there on each side of you could actually be mounted on yours. And when you save a file in there, it actually spreads it across their drives. It's a network attached clustering file system. It's cool. Uh, we actually have our servers running with that, our VM servers running with that because it works. <laughs> um, so there's various file systems you can pick from, but Usually you install Linux, you get ext4. That's the default. Yes? No, no, that's what kind of, fu uh, how can I describe this? It is how the files are stored on the disk, the organization system. Um, basically put fat writes the file, entries on where the files are a certain way. NTFS, which is the Windows file system, writes them a certain way. And these write it a certain way. In other words, where files are, what the limitations are, what the capabilities of what you can do with files is limited by the file system. The root partition is the file structure. The file structure has nothing, it has very little to do with the file system. The file system is the kind of file, like it's a low level. So basically the operating system asks the file system to write the files to the disk. But the operating system determines the layout of the files. The file system determines how they're written to the disk. Here's a good example. I'm going to try to find a real world example. You work for a firm where there's an accountant. The accountant has a couple of assistants. He prepares some documentation. He decides what the file system looks like, but then he hands it in to Secretary Ray so she can run it and put it away. The secretaries like the file system. It decides, it takes care of running the stuff from one place to the other and making sure that the accountant can get what he needs without having to actually go dig for it. Does that make a bit more sense? Until you play with it, it's... But you won't play with anything but ext4 in this course, so you know I wouldn't worry about it too much. The other partition it needs is a swap. Remember earlier I talked about a swap space? So, Normally, it's supposed to be two to three times the amount of physical RAM you have in your computer. And this used to be really, really important back in the day when your computer had 64 megs of RAM. <coughs> or even a gig or two of RAM. Because as you load programs, they occupy RAM. You load some other programs, they also occupy RAM. So if you keep putting stuff into it, Eventually, what happens? You run out of RAM. It's like this bottle. I can keep putting water into it, and eventually what happens is it overflows. What the swap space does is it pretends to be it's virtual memory. Imagine there's like a little magic spigot at the side. And it takes the water that has been touched the least and puts it into this temporary space. So if I need the water that's in this temporary space off to the side, it takes a little longer because it's got to go get it from the temporary storage. Find enough fruit in this bottle, so it's got to take what's in this bottle, take some of it out, take what's in the space, the swap space, put it back in memory. Swap space is slow, obviously. The RAM is really, really fast. Swap space only goes as fast as your hard drive, or in the, depending on your computer, the interface to your hard drive. And as fast as 
I mean, you got to think hard drives used to be really slow back in the day. I remember when 7,200 RPM drives came out and I was just blown out of the water how fast those were. Like, wow. Actually, I remember being impressed by 5,400. <coughs> you know, it's speed. The slower the drive, the slower the swap space is. So essentially, you're basically creating a temporary holding bin two to three times the size of the amount of RAM you have in your machine. So now some computers have 32 gigs of RAM. That means you're making a 64 gig swap space. That's an awful lot of swap space. At that point, you can probably go one to one once you go past a certain size. But if you're working in a low memory environment, like one or two gigs of RAM, give it six gigs on the disk. That way it has lots of room for programs to run. It does memory paging. That's a, I think if I remember right, one of the hybrids actually covers that. It does, it's invisible. You can't see the swap space. It's not available for you to navigate into. But the kernel, which is basically the, the tiniest little piece of the operating system that manages everything, it can see the swap space and it manages it. You can have up to 64 swap spaces mounted at any given time. So theoretically, you could have 64 partitions of swap space. No idea. One of the popular ways of, do, of, reason, of doing, using it is to um, take these swap spaces and put them on multiple disks. So as you need to access swapped out memory, you can read from more than one disk at once. Therefore, you're reading in parallel. So it's a bit like this where let's say I had six people lined up here and I need information from person five. I got to get through persons one to four first to get to person five. But if I had it split up into two columns, in other words, I got two swap spaces, there's only three people in each one. So that means I only need to go through two to get to the back most. The more disks you have, the faster you can get at the swap space. There is a limit, obviously, 64. Uh, but really, most of the time you don't need that much. Um, there's a command called free. It'll tell you how much swap space you have. Okay. <sighs> the XT2 file system. That's basically the first file system for Linux. It stands for Second Extended File System. Whew, they were original. Uh, the first extended file system sucked and then decided it wasn't worth keeping around. So they created a version two and away it went. It came out in 93. Um, the original EXT file system had big limitations. Thus, they created a new one to get rid of limitations. It does not have journaling. Journaling is an interesting feature uh, that avoids corruption. Um, if you have a flash drive or USB drive, EXT2 is recommended uh, because it does need to have the overhead of journaling. Journaling is used as a way of mitigating damage to your file system on slow disks. Anybody here ever have the moment of you're walking through a room and somebody trips on the cord of your desktop PC? And it either unplugs from either end, you only hear two. And then there's screaming in the middle of an Overwatch match. But back in the day, that choom sound probably meant you lost something. It was a bad day. And EXT2, if the computer lost power, whatever it was doing to the disk at that time was lost. With the journaling, it would write down a little journal of the stuff that's about to happen so that if the file system were to shit the bed, it could look at the journal and try to replay parts of the journal. Or at least roll back to before the journal so that it would stay safe. Um, if you're really curious on how journaling works, that's, there's Google for that. It gets really, really technical really, really fast. All I know is uh, journaling's good. No journaling bad. Um, but they say on flash drives and USB disks because they're so fast, Journaling's not that important. Um, individual files, anywhere from 16 gigs to two terabytes. An EXT2 file system can be from two terabytes to 32 terabytes. 
And that's the old original file system from 1993. It'll handle up to 32 terabytes. That's a big hard drive. Usually that would be a, a um, RAID array at that point when you're talking about that much space. EXT3 stands for third extended file system. It came out in 2001. Um, came out with kernel 2.4. It allowed journals, journaling, higher security. Uh, the changes happened to the file system were tracked better. Uh, you could actually have uh, auditing. So there's auditing features. So you could see what user changed what files. It added a lot of overhead, but it was cool because you could really know who screwed up the file. Um, it has a dedicated area in the file system and all the changes are tracked. So every time a change happens, it actually writes a little journal entry saying, you know, Dan on this date did this. Dan on that date deleted this file. Dan on this date renamed this file. And you can convert an EXT2 file system to an EXT3 with a simple command. So you can upgrade in place and it's instant. Um, file limitations, the same as EXT2. EXT4 came around, the fourth extended file system. I mean, they're not exactly original. Um, came out in 2008, came out with kernel 2.6, 0.19. But it was been in beta since like kernel 2.4 and change. Um, the biggest thing is file sizes have gotten larger. It handles big file sizes. It was designed for server farms. 16 gigs to tera 16 terabytes per file. Um, essentially, you can get an exabyte. That's a really big number. Um, very few companies ever talk about exabytes as something they have in their in their building. Uh, Amazon, Microsoft, Google might be some of the few that track their disk space in exabytes. Um, so essentially it's a 1,024 petabytes, which is 1,024 terabytes, which, how many of you have a terabyte hard drive in your laptop? Okay. Take your laptop, multiply by 1,024, then multiply by 1,024. That's a petabyte. Um, no, 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 yeah. And then multiply that by another 1,024, now you got your exabyte. So this whole room would be needed like three times over with his laptop closed and stacked to store that much space. Um, it can now have 64,000 subdirectories instead of 32,000 subdirectories. Um, you can in-place upgrade an EXT3 to EXT4. You don't have to even do anything. You can actually mount it and treat it as an EXT4 if you want. Um, EXT4 runs better than EXT3. Basically, they took EXT3, fixed the quirks, fixed the bugs, made it faster, and called it EXT4. Uh, with EXT4, you can turn off journaling. In other words, you can keep all the benefits of EXT4 without any of the journaling features. So if you're running on a SSD or on an M2 drive or a PCI Express hard drive, turn off the journaling and you will actually get, improve the performance of your operating system because the disk is fast enough to survive it. All right, Linux is able to read the following file systems. EXT2, EXT, EXT3, EXT4, obviously. NFS, network file system. The file system that won't die, um, it is terrible. But it allows you to mount, on my laptop I want to access Bruce's files. And he's running an NFS server, I can mount his file system on my laptop as a subdirectory. And then Bruce's laptop turns off and my laptop hangs. <laughs> That's NFS. There was not, we, we used them at work for a while because it was the only way we could do it and we stopped this first chance we had. Uh, yeah, pretty much. Uh, you lose the other end, it's over. MS-DOS, 
It's DOS. Uh, VFAT, also known as FAT32. Not quite accurate, but we'll go with it. Because there's VFAT and then VFAT. There's a FAT32, VFAT, and um, XFAT, EXFAT. NTFS, that's sort of a lie. Um, it's able to read them, yes. Recently it's been put into the kernel that it has it up till about five years ago. And you may still run across Linux servers from five years ago out there that can't read NTFS. You have to install special add-ons. It's able to read HPFS from the best operating system ever. <laughs> and people are laughing when I say that, but OS2 was the shit. It was fantastic. And did you know half the bake machines out there are still running it? That's how good it is. It was secure, it was safe, and it didn't crash unless you tried to run AutoCAD 13 on it. Then it blew up. And then it says, I blew up. Hang on, I'll boot you in Windows more so you can use the application. It would actually recover. Saying, I blew up, and I know why I blew up, so I know how to not make this happen again. It was a good operating system. ISO 9660, also known as CD-ROMs. Uh, SysV, so that's ANT's Unix file system. It's a bit of a dinosaur. HFS, not that kind of Mac. The one that came before that kind of Mac, up to Mac OS 9. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's, it is what it is. Uh, HFS, um, QNX4. Anybody here know what QNX is? No, and you live in Ottawa? If you, don't, if you live in Ottawa and you don't know what QNX is, that's bad. They got bought by BlackBerry. QNX is a company that makes a real-time operating system. Um, it is used all over the place, including Canadian warships. It is a very, uh, it's an OS that's very hard to kill. Anybody actually ever have the modern Blackberries before they started using Android? BB10? Well, those that used BB10 might have discovered how freaking awesome that operating system was. You could not kill that phone. It never got slow, it never crashed, and your applications never misbehaved. Why? Because QNIX was cool. It did all kinds of nifty tricks that other operating systems wish they could do. Because it's uh, very user-friendly. Uh, BlackBerry had a chance to make it great and they, they blew it. That's just everything with lately, that's BlackBerry's life story. Um, actually, uh, pretty much two-thirds of the car's info statement systems now run QNIX. Embedded, embedded OSs. Um, if you buy a really expensive car, it's running QNIX as its embedded OS. It's really nifty. You basically you've got a company from Ottawa running the engines of like a Maserati. Just saying. I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, then there's NCPFS and a bunch of others. That's Novell. And there's so many file systems it supports, the list is as long as my, it's, it's insane. It's like longer than my line. Basically anything that has a disk that can be read, Linux can read it. You may need to add an add-on, but it will read it. Which is why Linux is the go-to for fixing things. If it can mount and read it, you can fix it, theoretically. Or at least extract enough out of it to salvage what was there. F-Disk. Lab 5, folks. Um, the F-Disk is a command line partition tool. It is dangerous. Um, you can do really bad things to your computer really fast. If you go fdisk-l and then you give it a special file name such as slash dev slash sda, it'll tell you the partitions on that disk. If you just go fdisk space slash dev slash sda, it launches into an interactive disk editor. And I'm doing the air quotes for this because it's interactive in the sense of it's, how many of you have done lab five or at least tried to do lab five? How awesome is fdisk? <laughs> it's not very user friendly. It's not obvious. Um, but you can use it to edit the, fi the file tables. So the partition table, you can change 
uh, change the file types on these partition tables. You can make partitions bootable. Anything you have to do with a partition table, you can do using FDisk. It's also able to read and access most modern file systems. Because it doesn't care about the file system, it ignores the file system, it cares about what contains. It's sort of like, you could look at it this way. It can look at a house, it knows how many rooms are in the house. You know, it knows what each kind of room is. It doesn't care what that room is because it knows how to knock down the walls or how to add new walls in your house. That's what it does. It's, you can't use it to resize a partition. You can use it to create a partition, to delete a partition, to change what the file system is of that partition. If you need to resize, you need different tools. It has two menu fung levels. So when you launch it, it has the general functions. All the basic functions managed partitions are there. There's advanced mode. Um, you can change the file system type without having to repartition. Then as the guy who created the slideshow show originally, there's a nice big red warning. Do you remember in lab one when we had you make a backup of your Linux? That's why. Um, if you don't plan ahead what you're about to do, and you don't have a backup, and you accidentally do the wrong thing, which is usually you make a mistake and instead of hitting quit or control Z, you hit W, things are gone. Uh, by the way, W means write, changes to disk and exit. Once you've done that, you're done. So, to create a file system, there's a couple of steps that have to be followed every single time. Um, step one, actually there's a step zero that's not listed here. Anybody want to take a guess what step one, a zero is? Yeah. <laughs> no, seriously. I've actually had somebody say, I tried to partition my drive and it's not working. Where's your drive? And, he was, and I just let him walk into the guy's office. And this is a Windows developer, right, who doesn't actually understand hardware. His hard drive was sitting right there. His tower. <laughs> and I, I'm using my phone because it's almost the size of an SSD, right? <coughs> he says, I got my drive and I don't know why I can't see it. I actually had to walk away and go. I actually had to go outside and go we'll recollect myself for a minute. <laughs> there was a moment, and I'm like, holy crap. And what do you write for a living? Oh, yeah, device drivers. Oh. Well, actually, device drivers for printers and cutters. Totally different. But these things happen. Um, it's entertaining, to say the least. The, um, so the fdisk command, I'm just making sure my battery's not dead on my microphone. <laughs> The fdisk command um, will show the partition table with the different file systems on it. Um, you can actually just do it straight from the command line. There's a few options. Uh, L lists the partition table of the devices that you pointed to. V, the version number. So first of all, you identify, make sure the disk is empty using fdisk-l. So then what you do is you use the first step one is you use fdisk, you go into the disk, Create your partitions, lab five, right? Create primary, primary partition one, create primary partition two, create extended partition, create the other three little partitions inside of there. You know, that's lab five, which I summarized in less than 10 seconds. That's step one. This is lab six. Step two, you create the file system. So you format the drive. Formatting a drive is not something to be taken lightly. Um, yeah, formatting drives can be really dangerous. When I got my first PC, I didn't know what format meant. Because before that, I had a Commodore 64, which formatting was format of floppy for use. And I loaded in the BIOS because I'd gotten this PC on my first day. I go, what's this low-level format? I wonder what that does. Enter. You know what I learned that day? How to install Windows 3.1. <laughs> and you know what we didn't have back then? Google. We learned the hard way. <coughs> I also learned that low-level format voided the warranty of your hard drive, which was awesome to find out. I'm glad my drive never died. But 
just saying. Uh, don't mess with format. On Windows and DOS, it's called format. On Linux, it's called MKFS, make file system. Um, essentially, it has a, you can format, define hard drive partitions. Uh, it's not really defining the partition, you're just defining what's inside that partition. MKFS dash T, you tell what kind of file system you're creating, and then you tell it the partition. So if your drive is SDA, and you want to format partition number five, you go slash dev slash SDA five. By the way, in labs five and six, you're working with SDB. Don't type MKFS slash dev slash SDA, because you know what you're going to be doing next? is you're gonna to go to your clone of your VMware set image, and you're gonna be working from there going forward. Because you just wiped your primary disk for your Linux install. You can also format floppy disks, slash dev, slash FD0. After you've created your file system, you're gonna make sure it's alive. And then you use the FSCK command. For those that think they're clever, they usually swap out one of the letters. Because normally, the only time you need to run FSCK is right after you said the other word. That is spelt almost exactly the same. You know, you've probably seen the neck beers that walk around the FS, FSCK this shirt. There, there used to be those. You, you see them when they, those were just as the pocket protectors were going out of style and nerds actually started becoming popular. They still thought they were clever, so they have the FSCK this shirt. For those that can't actually make the logical jump to the letter I'm talking about, yeah, FSCK. After you've formatted your file, you've checked your disk, so you do FSCK, you give it uh, the type in case you want to make sure it checks as the correct file system type. You can skip the type and just say slash dev slash SDA2 slash SDA3, whatever you want, and it'll check the file system, make sure everything's happy. This is a bit like um, check disk on Windows. Or check disk for DOS. When things would go horribly wrong, you'd run check disk. It wasn't as colorful. But it serves the same purpose. The only difference is FSCK is significantly more powerful, whereas check disk can just do DOS and MTFS. You can use FSCK to actually test, fix, a DOS or an MTFS partition. It's a great tool to recover. The next step is you mount the file system. So you create a directory somewhere, and then you type in the appropriate mount command. And let me check the time, because I'll probably do a quick demo, time permitting, looks good. Because if, I, if I'm right, I'm almost done. And, okay. Of course, being typical of PowerPoint, I can't actually see what slide I'm on. So, there's a few other file systems you can create. If you're working with a swap partition, you can go MK swap, make swap. Then you can go swap on, swap off. You go swap on, guess what that does? It turns on the swap partition. Your OS now knows it can actually write its memory into that space. Then you go swap off. The operating system knows, hey, I'm not allowed to use this as, as a swap space anymore. Let's take the contents of this and load it up into memory so that we don't lose whatever's in that space. Um, mounting a file system. In Windows, it gives it a drive letter. Yay. That's all they say. You stick in a USB disk and you have a drive letter. You stick in a portable hard drive, you have a drive letter. It's mounted. Congratulations. It's almost idiot proof. Linux, on the other hand, um, it mounts the file systems as they're needed. If you don't want to use it, you don't mount it. It's not as convenient. But as the computer boots up, and if it doesn't need to access every, every drive plugged in, so you have two external hard drives and a USB stick and a couple of other devices plugged in that have file systems, when it first boots, it ignores all of those until you, you want them. Then you mount them as you need them. So it's not convenient for a user, but heck, the boot time's a lot better. 
Because when you boot up with well, Windows, it's pretty fast now, but there once was a time. You had all that stuff plugged in, Windows is taking its time, sweet time going, who are you? Who are you? Oh, I really like you. Oh, and you don't want to talk to me. That's fine. Now we crash. <laughs> but that was Windows. There's a few ways of mounting on Windows. If you really insist on mounting on Windows, you can use Disk Manager to actually change the drive letter, that kind of stuff. In Linux, the command is called mount. And you create a mount point. There's one that's generic slash MNT. You can create a directory anywhere and use it as a mount point. So you create, create a directory called the USB drive. You could theoretically mount your USB disk and you go CD USB drive. Suddenly you're looking at the insides of your USB disk. It treats it as a directory. It doesn't get a drive letter, it's just another directory somewhere on the file system. That's the mount point. All files get mounted somewhere under root. Why? Because you can't get past root. Root is the bottom. It's the genesis point of the operating system. Anything past that is below root. If you choose, and be careful, you can modify a file called fstab. fstab supplies the information required to mount a specific device. And if you have a file system listed in fstab, Linux will then try to mount it automatically on boot. It becomes a file system it knows. So it'll look, oh, is SDA5 here? Yes, let's mount it. That's what fstab does. So you can manually tell it which partitions you want to include. And Here's a breakdown of a disk. As you can tell, when this slide was made was years and years ago because he's actually using letters HD, not SD. These are the old parallel disks, the old ATA disks. But you know what? Swap the letter H for S and we're happy. HDA1 would be the root. You could have HDA2 as the boot partition. A lot of people like having the boot partition separate for some unknown reason. But there once was a time where it was a good idea. You'd have a mount point where you could have a floppy and a CD-ROM mounted. And then, theoretically, you could have Windows in another partition somewhere else, and Windows is bootable also. All right, so. That's as clear as it's gonna get, unless I start turning off every light in here. All right, so here's the results of fdisk-l. As you can see, SDA1, is a bootable partition. It shows where it starts and where it ends. As you notice, it starts at 2048. You know why it starts at 2048? In front of 2048 is the boot sector and the master, the, the master partition table. So that's why you're not allowed to create anything for 2048. <coughs> it basically reserves a whole 2K of the disk. And then you've got the extended partition and a swap space in here. Now, if I do the same thing with SDB, SDB doesn't have a valid partition table. Hot damn. Why not? Because I haven't done it yet. Okay, so there's no file system or any type on here. There's no main partition. So I'm going to create a partition. It's going to be a primary partition, partition number one. Starting here, I'm going to make it two hundred megabytes. Now I just printed the partition table, and you can see it's a Linux file system, file system type eighty three. Yay. I could create another partition. No, it's in memory. So what's happening, these changes yet have, don't happen. They haven't happened yet. Basically, I'm making a change list. And it's being stored in memory. So I'm going to start at the next available space. And I'm going to make that one all the way to the end. And okay, now if I print my list again, you'll see. There's my two partitions, one and two. Now, 
if I choose to, I could now control Z, or I could also hit Q to quit. I could A use A, I'm pointing at this, like that's useful. I can make it bootable. I don't want to mess with that right now because I could script my boot sequence a little bit. Um, there's a few other things you can change in here. However, I'm going to leave that alone. Now, if I do this, this shows every file system that fdisk understands. Then most of you guys are working in a tiny little window, so you can actually see them all on screen at the same time. One of the perks of using a, ter a dumb terminal type interface, you can see all of it. And we're talking, you know, FAT12. Did you know before FAT32 there was something before FAT32? There was FAT16 and FAT12. <coughs> HPFS, NTFS, and XFAT. AIX, that's IBM's Unix. Windows 95. The Compact Diagnostic Partition. That was a great one to play with. A bunch of others. Plan 9. If you're curious what Plan 9 is, go take a look. Was no, from AT&T. But it's pretty much might as well have been from outer space. But there's Qnix and Amoeba, a bunch of DOS ones. BOS, the operating system that was supposed to replace Mac, and they went nowhere. And all these other ones. So I'm going to do W to write it. The partition table exists. So if I go F disk. Dash L. Now I have a partition table. And as you can tell, I'm at the command lines. That means it now exists. <coughs> Bang. I typed in the command make file system. I just formatted my SDB1. I'm going to format SB2 as EXT2. That one's done also. As you can see, FDisk doesn't care. It doesn't see it as being anything else. It's still a Linux partition. It doesn't care what the inside of it looks like. As I was saying, FDisk looks at the structure of the house. It doesn't care what color the wall the walls are painted. The file system is basically the color of the walls or the function of the room. One's a bathroom, one's a kitchen, one's a bedroom. F just doesn't care. It cares about the walls that keeps the bathroom from the kitchen. Because you know how much that would suck having your bathroom in your kitchen? And so there's you know, it's not a good thing. So it cares about the walls and makes sure the walls are there. I've created my two file systems. Now There's nothing under my mount folder. I can create a, I'll make a directory called uh, So now, I've got two directories called sdb1 and sdb2. I can go mount And now you guys are going, well, what's the difference? There's absolutely no difference, except if I go to sdb1, see there's a lost and found directory in here, and I go touch me. And I got a file in here called me. I'm going to unmount sdb1, and now there's no file. Why? Because I disconnected that disk by typing the mount and the unmount. For those of you that are trying to connect this to what happens inside of Windows. You know you plug in a USB stick and they always recommend to eject it before you unplug it? That's because when you do the eject, it unmounts the disk. <coughs> and it runs a file, basically an IO control and flushes the rest of the write buffer to the disk and then unmounts it so Windows can't touch it anymore. Then it's safe to unplug. That's basically what mount and unmount does. As if I were to go back here and go, <sighs> 
to here. Look, my files are back because I remounted it. It's like magic. I said it's like magic. It's like people that believe Chris Angel is real. It's magic, but it's technical magic. You can make files and files appear and disappear. If you don't have, yes. Come again? I unmounted it. I caught that part. What was after that? So what you have, when you go to mount, you have to have a mount point. A mount point is a directory. So you create a directory, and it's a real directory. It exists. And I could go into SDB1. So I'm in SDB1, and now I've created a file called that. Now I mounted it. That's not there because me's there. Essentially, it's a directory. And when you start messing with the mounts, you can actually replace the contents of that directory. It's, I'm being a bit disingenuous here. Um, basically, what mount does, it looks at that directory, and it changes the meaning of that directory in the file system temporarily. And it says, this directory really isn't a directory. It's actually pointing to over here. So I'm doing a little bit of Jedi mind to call it, you know, these are not the droids you're looking for. Right? Well, this directory is actually there. You're, you're basically telling the operating system that this directory is actually, a, it points to an entire file system. While it's mounted, you're playing in that file system. You unmount it, it's as if that directory suddenly becomes available for you to play with again. It's a cute trick. You can hide your stuff that way if you want. If somebody's really good, they can unmount all the disks and still find all your stuff, but at least at a cursory glance, it hides your stuff. But realistically, you don't want to write stuff into that directory that's mounted because now the command earlier was mount. So if you're trying to figure out if your file system is mounted, actually, let me go mount this again. <coughs> and you'll see right here all the different file systems that are mounted. Here's my root partition. Do you notice it's the first one? It will always be the first one. It's C64. It's mounted for read-write. On error, remount, read-only. In other words, if something's gone horribly wrong, don't let me screw it up. Proc is mounted. Sys is mounted. A bunch of nuns are mounted. Same thing over here, and then down here, there's the one I just mounted, SDB1. If I were to, and then I run this again, you'll see it's not down here anymore. That's about it. So I just blew through lab five and lab six. I didn't do every step of it, but I did every, basically every major task in both in 10 minutes. Yeah, pretty much like when you're not sure what you're trying to do, the video covers it. Okay, so that brings us to the, yeah. Oh, my friend, find your Ukrainian friend, yes. I know you were, and I didn't talk about it. I did not. This isn't Soviet Russia. We can talk about anything. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. That was very inappropriate. I apologize. <laughs> yeah. Actually, honestly, lost and found is when your disk gets mounted dirty. In other words, the computer crashed. And your... The file system, your computer reboots, discovers the file system has been damaged of some sort. It runs the FSCK commands, not FSCK, the uh, check disk commands. And any files it finds that are now damaged, but is able to recover, it'll put them in the lost and found. So 
They're pointers, they're files that have an inode. It knows there's a file here, but it looks at the inode list and goes, I don't have a file that matches this inode, even though this inode is occupied. Therefore, I'm assuming it's been lost and now it's going to be found. Does that make a bit of sense? Pardon me? <laughs> I'm just teasing. <laughs> but yeah, so that's what lost and found is for. It's basically when files get lost by file corruption, whatever, uh, the, the disk repair tools will put pointers to those files. Um, those of us that have dealt with computers back in the DOS days, uh, used, we used to have a command called undelete where you could delete a file and then if you were fast enough, you could undelete this file. Or you could use a special tool and you'd boot the special tool and it would crawl through the whole file system looking for files that are no longer, that no longer exist but the data is still there. And it would go and extract those files with temporary file names so you could at least try to recover your documents if you accidentally nuked your stuff. The Linux file system and Unix file systems, I'm assuming the Macs also, have a lost and found, and they're there in case the file system gets damaged. Anything it finds that it can, thinks you might want, it puts in there. Any other questions? Going once, going twice, going three times. <laughs> <laughs>